Okay, here's a question for you while I'm waiting. Uh, you see that 1890, um, Philadelphia at that time was the second largest city in the U.S. Had a police mounted patrol, 16 stables with 160 horses. And I remember back in the, seven, maybe John, you would know, uh, back in the s middle 70s, I've been in Maine since 72, sometime a few years after that, maybe the early 80s, there was a, uh, a police horse patrol in Portland. Oh, yeah. yes. Does everybody remember yeah. that? Well, they were, they were and there. Bonnie said they were stabled under a parking garage? They were stabled right down by Fitzpatrick Stadium. By Hadlock Field. Oh, by Hadlock Field. Field. They were, they were, they were, they were underneath that building. The, X the old X Club. Okay, and I, what I remember is <clears throat> um, I saw them working. There was some sort of uh, a demonstration by the expo, and I can't remember what they were demonstrating against or for, but the crowd got really unruly, and pretty soon these guys on horseback showed up. I think, as I remember, there was three of them, but you know, it just like, it was wonderful. The horses just kind of backed into the crowd, and then they just took a, side, they, a little side pass, <laughs> and they just, this, this crowd that was kind of unruly, they just kind of broke it up, and it was just a remarkable thing to see. And the whole thing just fizzled, and the people dispersed and went home. So, and I just wanted to get that information because I didn't know what had happened to them, and I assume it was budgetary. Oh, it was in the 90s. Yeah, they had gotten, gotten down to two horses, and one of the riders actually lived on my road. Didn't they get back together for a few years ago? Uh, they were there for, yeah, but only in the summertime. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they didn't, they weren't anyway, I, I wanted to clear that up, so that's great. So uh, I wanted to start out with a praise for the, where is Lynn? Where'd you go? Is she blown down? No, you know, just, you know, I have been here now three or four times, and every time I come, it's better. And you're doing more, and it's, it's just so wonderful. It's, it's a great, it's a great place. Um, I, I was, had a, it was really fun last time I was here a couple of weeks ago. I talked to Nick some, and uh, I love what he's doing in the repair shop, and I love what's going on in the blacksmith shop, so it's really incredible. Yeah. So here's the take home. This is what I'd like to have you take home. Um, the realization that we owe our horses a huge debt, you know? Um, and you're going to see through this talk that from after the Civil War until the 20s, horses were extremely important in this country and on the farms for sure, but on the cities, more so in the cities. And that's what I'm going to be concentrating on. So um, I want you to leave with that realization. And also the realization that history is not dead like I thought it was in high school. I had to memorize dates and names. I thought, well, what is this all about? But you know, history is not dead. It is right here on this place. And we're lucky in Maine, it's all around us. All you have to do is open your eyes. Um, I was not particularly interested in history. And then Bonnie and I came here, <coughs> something like we moved from Lewiston and we came to New Gloucester about 30 years ago. And we, we bought this old farm across from my neighbor, Les, who helped me put it back together. But it's like the, uh, we found out that there was a, 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 a chicken, used to be a chicken house on the farm. And there was, when I walked in the barn, there was two slip stalls. Everybody know what a slip stall is? It's not a box stall for horses. It's just like a chute they go in and stand, OK? That's a slip stall. There were slip stalls for two workhorses. There was tie-ups for six horses, uh, six cows. It was very much a working farm. Um, there's a, a stone wall out back. I was pulling weeds, and I, start, I started pulling out crockery. Back in the day, that's what people did with all their old stuff. They threw it on the stone wall. And there's another spot on the farm where I, I'm always digging up horseshoe nails, and that's where the blacksmith shop was. So all of a sudden, I got very interested in history and horses of the day. So um, as far as being, um, I, I made the statements all around us, 
When we drove down here today, we drove down Route 231, which connects New Gloucester and North Yarmouth. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a beautiful tree there, and it's called the Old Red Oak. And that tree is, uh, was a sapling. They've done core samples on the tree. That old oak tree was a sapling when George Washington was president of the United States. Isn't that incredible? That tree that you can walk, you know, walk up to, it's right next to the, their pretty little botanical garden. And you can, you can walk up to it and there's, you know, it's that old and it's been, it's been through a lot of history. Dave, have you ever seen the tree in Pittsburgh at the old church? It's a linden tree that was planted when George Washington was president. It's That's, huge. Yeah, and there's another one. And then there was in Yarmouth, there was old Herbie. Herbie. And that, he's, they took him down, what, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. So the history is all around. It's, it's just great. And, and I love it now. Um, of course, the wind blows through my house, but I still like it because of the history. <laughs> And I, I, I did a book signing up in Presque Isle uh, a couple years ago, I think. And um, the lady who had invited me, she said, come on out to my farm. I want to show you my new farm. So we went out to the farm, and there was a guy out in the field mowing. I said, it looks like he's using horses. She says, yeah, he is. He leases this field from me. So I went out to the field to talk to him, and he had just stopped. I said, don't stop for me. He said, no, it, the horse needs a break. And we talked for a long time. He's Amish, and he was using a mowing machine, a little uh, sickle uh, cutter, cutter bar on the mowing machine. And that's a, that's a kind of a tough thing for a horse because there's a lot of drag on a mowing machine. And so he'd like to give him a break every once in a while. And it was really fun to see somebody, you know, doing, using all the old equipment. Pretty soon his son came down with driving two more Percherons. He was just walking behind them and with the reins. And they switched the teams and he, the new team went on the mowing machine. And they switched the teams every hour while they're mowing. So it's great. As I say, history's all around. Uh, I also want to tell you about Wally Bragdon. <clears throat> Does anybody here know Wally? Wally is a, a guy from New Gloucester that I got to know. And uh, he was born in 1928, which makes him 94, if I've got my numbers right. Pardon me? 28 to 23, 95 this year. 95? Yeah. Okay. He's 95. <laughs> and uh, I, I always like to question people who are older than me. Uh, how, you know, did, did you grow up with horses? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He says, we had a horse. And he lives on, what's the name of the road? It's where the Scotias live. One over from us. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And uh, he said, we had a horse, a family horse, and he, 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 we worked him in the garden, and we took him into town because we, we did not have a car. And so... And, and I said, well, tell me, tell me about your experience with a horse. He says, well, one time I was asked by my mom to go get groceries. So I harnessed up the horse and, and we, I went down in the buggy. It's about a two-mile drive from where he lives. And he said, I went in the store. The store, if you know New Gloucester, it's where Lynx was. And there was a general store there. And he said, I got the stuff my mom wanted. I gave him the note. He wrote down what we owe. He said we, they never took money. He never took money from us. It was like he went in and paid once a month. And I was chatting with him, and I walked out. He was 12 years old at the time. He walked out, and the horse was gone, and the wagon was gone, and the groceries were gone. <laughs> and the horse had decided to go home. He'd, he'd been waiting long enough. So uh, you know these stories are fun. Bonnie and I went to a bean supper a few months ago in Gray. And there's a guy there by the name of John Williams, who is two years older than uh, Wally. And I asked him the same question. Did you grow up with horses? He said, yeah, we, I remember horses. He said, it was a horse that delivered our ice. And I said, so you didn't have a refrigerator? No, he says we had an ice box. And he would come with this big wagon, and the horse knew right where to stop because he had a regular route. 
And he'd look in the window and there's a block of wood and it had numbers on it, two, four, six. And I, we would point the block of wood to what, how many pounds of ice we wanted and he would chip off uh, the block of ice, chip off that many pounds, put the canvas over his shoulder, throw the ice, uh, put the ice tongs on a thing, and then, uh, you know, we would get our ice. We never, we never had to talk to him. It was just that was the way, that was the way it worked. And it was, he was telling us about the horse. The horse knew every stop on the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if you went by and see that they didn't have a block in the window, that means they don't need any ice. But the horse would stop anyway and look back and say, we're supposed to be stopping for ice. Um, then there's my story about Dr. Tom Johnson. Dr. Johnson sitting right here with his wife, Mary Beth. And I was at the Memorial Day Parade in New Gloucester, which we go to every year. And I think you guys go every year. And, and we were talking about there was, a, there was a unit that was marching in the parade that was a Civil War unit. And Tom shared with me about his family history. <clears throat> and I went home and I thought about it a lot. I thought, wow, this is an incredible story. And I called him up. I said, Tom, you have to tell me the story again. It turns out, so I'm going to make sure I get this right, Tom's dad, who I knew, this is Tom Johnson Sr., and I remember Tom as being... Hmm? Yeah, I took care of his horses. I got here in 72. Uh, the, the, the family, he, was, he loved his standard breads. And so, um, and so I worked on his horses. And interestingly enough, a little bit later, I worked on his granddaughter's horses, which is Tom's daughter, at Meadow Lane Stable in New Gloucester. Anyway, I'm losing the track of my story here, ADD. So I said, Tom, let me get this straight. And this is the story he told me. Tom's father, Tom, who I knew, I remember Tom as being tall, at least I know he's taller than me, and, and he's a southern gentleman, very soft-spoken, right? Just, he has a very successful business in Lewiston, Auburn. His grandfather, fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War, okay? The interesting part about this is that Tom's, on the mother's, Tom's mother's side, her grandfather fought for the North, because, for the Union, and she was brought up in Auburn, I think. And, or, or, well, in Maine, for sure. Okay, yeah. So, isn't that amazing? So. Here's his history, right here. It's just phenomenal. And since then, Tom has been spending, sending me all these great things about his family. I'm getting all this information. It's really neat. One of the things, one of the things he emailed me was this uh, advertisement for the Auburn Stud, and the name of the stud was the Seer. And Tom, you don't know what year this was, do you? Uh, 1895. It was the same year that Queen Anne was built. Okay, that so eight. So, so I've I've done. got a whole bunch of stuff like this here. So I want you to come look this over when the talks over. And well, I'll, Governor here Baslin, uh, former Governor Baslin, had horses in that sale. Okay. And it was his son that owned. Okay. Queen okay. So the name of the horse was the Seer, and what's interesting about it, the Seer's record was, he did, he paced, or trotted, which was he. He was a pacer, and he paced his mile in two minutes, two fifteen and three quarters. That wouldn't even qualify him. He, he couldn't make a qualifying race today. So, of course, everything's different. The equipment's different, and, and the horses are better bred. But anyway, there's that. So thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, so that was the Civil War. <clears throat> Civil War uh, started at Fort Sumter, S-U-M, I used to think it was Sumter, but it's not, S-U-M-T-E-R. <clears throat> South Carolina had seceded from the Union. But to 
their chagrin in the middle of Charleston Harbor, Charleston, South Carolina, right in the middle of the harbor was a big fort, which was a Union fort. And they didn't like the fact that the Union fort was in their state. They had just broken away from the nation. And so the commanding general uh, of the forces in South Carolina, I think it was Beauregard, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Mary? I think so. Yeah. So he asked for them to surrender, you know, get out of here, we're taking over the fort. And the commander of the fort said, no, no. I haven't gotten any orders to surrender this fort. I'm staying here. So I said, okay, we're going to turn the guns on you. So they did. They started uh, the cannon fire on this fort. By the way, if you'd like to know what this fort looks like, I thought, this fort looks so familiar when I saw the drawings of it. And if you've ever been out to Peaks Island, you go by Fort George's. That's hexagonal fort. The two look exactly the same. I'll bet it was the same federal architects. It was? Sometime. You know that? Yes, I do. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. This is so good. And, and Jefferson Davis, he was, before he was president of the Confederacy, he was Secretary of War. He came up to Portland to check on how it was going. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got a little more history. <laughs> this is so good. Okay, so, all right, <clears throat> you're going to surrender? No, we're not going to surrender. And a federal, uh, a federal ship tried to get in, but the, they were turned away by all the cannon fire. So this went on, the bombardment went on for two days, and finally the, the uh, commanding officer said, okay, we surrender, we're running out of food anyway. So that was, they had terms of surrender were, okay, good. Well, what happened was, and during that bombardment, no soldiers, nobody got hurt, except two mules killed, were killed inside. So these forts, there's always places to get out of the way of cannon fire, but if you're in the parade ground like a mule, two mules were killed. Then there was the ceremony to, uh, to um, turn the fort over. And what happened was that they were going to have a 100-gun salute. And they got to the 40th round, and one of the cannons blew up and killed a federal soldier. And he was the first death of the Civil War. So that's how the Civil War started. And at the end, uh, that one death turned into 620,000 men died on both sides. I mean, I mean, all together, I mean. And uh, now I'm getting to another point. One and a half million horses and mules died in the Civil War. Yeah. And you know, in the Civil War, 9,400 men in Maine never came home. So we took a tremendous hit. So after the Civil War, the movement uh, to the cities really intensified. And it turns out, you know, you think about life in the country, and it's like the farm we bought. There's a couple of horses. You have a bunch of chickens. You got a few cows. And you're pretty self-sufficient, right? And then, uh, so the farms weren't too big. It's like most of the farms around here, not too big. And so horses were not unusual. But in the cities, everybody started moving to the cities. When the cities of the day, 1800s right through, to, say, 1920, um, the cities were... There was no way of getting around except you walked or you got in a buggy and, or a, a cab. And um, the cities became crowded with horses, crowded with horses. So there were stables everywhere in cities. Uh, they were dangerous because they were very fire prone and there were a lot of, uh, a lot of fires in stables. Um, I checked my Bible because I had, I knew King Solomon had a lot of horses. He had 12,000 horses and, and he had many chariot cities. Those were his, t the tanks of the day. And so I'm, I'm thinking about New York and I'm thinking about Boston and I'm thinking about Philadelphia. I, I'm not thinking about the cities out west. I don't know anything about them. But um, those cities, I call the chariot cities because 
there were conveyances like you find across the street here in the museum everywhere okay and uh, people would ride in cabs I hope everybody has seen that was it a cab that cab with a, a Lynn was that from New York City or where was that Philadelphia. 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 That was a, at the time second largest city in the U.S. And if nobody knows the story, I'll tell you because uh, Patsy told me this and then Sheila told me the same story, sort of. That that, that cab, the, when you, it's way in the far part of the museum and the driver sat eight feet above the raw road. Where his head was eight feet above the water so he could really see and his fares were down below. And what happened in the early days is people would take a cab and then as soon as they got to their destination, they'd split. They didn't pay their fee. So this driver up there had a way of locking people in. So they take the fares, they're sitting down there and, and he could, would not release them in, uh, until he got his money. And he got his money through a little hole in the roof, which you can see that hole in the roof in there. It's a wonderful piece. And that's the way Sheila told me it's like um, it's pay up. Cab. It's a handsome cab. That's right. And so the saying was you're, you're, you're paying up. Or, or the way that I think I can't remember who was taking me around said it's you paying through the roof. So either way, it's a great story. And. It's, that, I, I, that's the piece I like the best out there. So um, the, the conveyances that were used in uh, New York City, for instance, where you have mostly uh, peddlers with one horse with the, and the horse is in the shafts and it's a cart, a two-wheel cart, not four wheels, and the, the driver or the handler would not uh, sit in the cart. He was walking alongside the horse. So there was lots of those over New York. And then uh, four-wheel wagons came in because they got the technology. They could then do the turns. And um, so you had those conveyances crowding the streets. And you had originally what's called an omnibus, which was like sort of like a big stage coach. You have one vehicle in the museum. I can't remember what it's called. It's sort of like that. The one that was used on Sugar Hill. What's that one called? Roof seat break. It's called what? A roof seat break. Is that what that big wheel is in there? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. So that hold a, held a bunch of people. And New York is getting more and more crowded. And uh, these are very clunky vehicles because the streets were cobblestones. And... Um, and, and apparently they were very uncomfortable. So finally they went to streetcars. They laid rails in the, in the street and uh, the, the, the horses pulled the streetcars. So it would be two horses to a streetcar. And uh, that was much easier for the horses, you know, because you, you had the rails. Yes, Nick? I gave a talk in the Owls Head Transportation Museum just to sort of give you an idea of the number. A man came up to me after the talk and he said that his uncle had 600 Belgian draft horses in New York City and their sole job was to deliver the newspapers. Oh. You, had a, you, know, you had a morning edition, an afternoon edition, and an evening edition. And so the Teamsters would, you know, would get their horses ready in the morning and then between editions they just hang out in the streets with the, with the teams. And not, not all the horses were on the streets all the time because right. some of them would be resting. But that's 600 horses just to deliver the newspapers. So there's a lot of numbers there. I'm looking for a number that it's, it's escaped me. I think the total number in horses in New York City at that time was, it's not on those sheets, is it? Hundred fifty thousand. Okay, you know I did a lot of research for this talk, and it turns out that um, I had seen between one hundred and thirty and one hundred and fifty, and then I got a little deeper in the research, and I found a number this morning as one hundred ninety thousand in New York, 
So they were everywhere. There were stables of a thousand horses, several, lots of those, and many floors, and the horses would go up and down long ramps. Um, I used to work in a barn, I'm retired now, but I used to work in a barn over in um, Turner Street, on Lower Street and Turner, and there's a big, huge barn there, and you look down the barn, you look from the barn, and there's a beautiful field below it, and it's a field that uh, floods, there's a little river that runs down there. And I figured it must have been very fertile land to support a huge barn like that. And I love that barn because it's one of the only ones I've been in where they have, still have the ramps. So the implements were kept on the ground floor. The horses were up, uh, probably perturans, would go up the ramps and uh, really kind of neat. It's always a thrill to me. I'd love to get invited to lunch in that house because I, I, they walk up the stairs. I wanted to walk up the ramp. <laughs> Yes. In New York City, getting rid of all that manure yes. was a problem. Yes. And not only that, there were dead horses on the street. Yes. So yes. It was sanitation That's right. was a big challenge. Yes. The manure was a huge problem. Okay, a horse will, will drop between 50 and 35 pounds of manure a day, plus several gallons of urine. And the manure was a huge problem. In fact, um, if they didn't keep up with it, often on the streets, it would be ankle deep. There's photographs of that. And so they had, they had people, and they, they were supposed to be dressed in white uniforms, and they would go in carts, not, the, not a wagon, but a cart. That's the just single horse and a cart. You want a cart because a cart will tip, right? So you put manure in, it's like a dump cart. And that's all they did was pick up manure every day. There were also entrepreneurs who would stand on street corners, and when a lady with a long dress would want to walk from here, to Macy's, they would take her over and they had a shovel and a broom and they would clear the path. <laughs> I call them escorts. But, okay. Um, I, I do want you to, when you're, when you're done, to come up and look at some of the stuff up here. Um, this is a horse that my neighbors, Les and Ray Jean sitting back here, gave me. This is a great, this is Horses, Horses, 149 Main Street, Auburn, a sale March 13th, 1902. Um, and these horses were out of Iowa. They weighed 1,200 to 1,500 pounds. When I was uh, first started working in Maine, I worked at the, uh, I was in Lewiston Fairgrounds a lot, working on standard breads. And there was a guy there who was an old blacksmith, and he was in his late 70s at the time, and he was just getting done. And he named, his name was Billy Wagg. Does anybody here have, knows Billy Wagg? I'll bet your dad used him. No, I think I met him. Yeah. And one day I was at his farm in Green, and he said, I want to show you something. And he took me on a drive, and we went to this old platform next to an old railroad track. And he said, this is where the horses came from Canada. And they were all draft horses, mostly Belgians. And this is where they unloaded. And I don't know where they went in green, but you know, I can't check on anything now. But uh, that was, I was fascinated that this is, he said, regularly we had train loads. They would have pack 24 to a car and bring them down from Canada. Yeah, so it's, history is all around us. It's really cool. <laughs> okay, back to the the ADD. So people were moving from the, from the uh, small farms into cities. Did you know in Yarmouth there was 300 <laughs> big ships, like sailing ships, uh, you know, uh, schooners built right here in town um, from in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So in uh, July, uh, after the Civil War, on July 4th, 1866, so this is a year after the Civil War ended, some kids were playing with firecrackers on Commercial Street, what's now Commercial Street, right across from where Becky's Diner is. Do you know where Becky's Diner is? Good food, huh? 
<laughs> and they were throwing the firecrackers, and some got in a wood pile, and it caught fire. And Portland had its worst fires. Portland's had many fires for the years. At one time, the British bombed what was then Falmouth, and there was a tremendous fire. This fire started on Commercial Street, swept up Commercial Street, went down India Street, and went all the way up Munjoy Hill and stopped just short of the observatory. So the observatory that had been put there by Jefferson, or was it Washington? Lemuel Moody. Hmm? Lemuel Moody. But who was the president at the time? Oh, I'm not sure who the president was. Yeah. So anyway, um, and this was, this was a huge fire in Portland. And um, this, it was the biggest fire in the United States to that date. <clears throat> and um, I'm telling you this because I, it was sort of interested me, and I wanted to see what firefighting was like back in the day. So I went to the Portland Fire Museum. Has anybody been there? Isn't that fun? Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's two guys there, Dana and Mike, and they're the ones who run it. It is run every Wednesday from June to September from 11 to 2. And that's it. <laughs> and these two guys put on a show that's a lot of fun. Have you been there, Nick? Yeah. It's great. But again, Wednesdays, 11 to 2. <laughs> and it's called Fire Museum? Yeah. Portland the Portland Fire, Fire Museum. Museum. It's on Spring Street. And tell them what the horses have to do immediately after the doors are thrown open. Yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is what happens. Uh, well, when you go in, first of all, let me tell you about the, the equipment you see. You walk in, and there's a whole bunch of fire buckets, the old-fashioned fire buckets. At that time, you had to, this, we're talking about now the 1800s. Everybody in Portland was required to have two buckets. So when there was a fire, you were also expected to go and help fight the fire. So a bucket brigade would get going, you dip it in a fountain or a, or a pond or wherever, and uh, you are part of the line, and the guy who's close to the fire throws it and then passes a bucket back, continue a line of fire. So that was their first fire department, first firefighting in Portland. The second thing that happened was the, the pumper was invented, which is like a, it's about the size of a pickup truck, maybe a little bit bigger, and it has two big long handles on it. They have a great one there. It's wonderful. And uh, there, you can get 12 men in a side, and you, you're pumping, and you're supposed to pump every second. And they say these firemen were good for about 10 minutes, and then you had to take a break and somebody else. But it gave a steady stream of water on the fire. They had an example of that there. And then they have right next to it a steam engine, firefighting steam engine. So these are huge things. They weigh two and a half tons. And this main component is a boiler, which is just like a boiler, an oil boiler in your basement. And that heats water very hot, very quickly. And the water turns to, it turns to steam. The steam, you know, if you, I, I might, you know, when I grew up, we had a pressure cooker. You know? <laughs> and the little thing on top, little weight on top. And you know, that's, you know, I played around with that a lot. And that steam is powerful coming out. It burns you, but it also has a lot of power. So steam is a great source of power. The problem is you have to have something really rugged to hold it because there's a lot of pressure. And a lot of the early steam engines, steam engines were invented way back in the 1700s, but they had a tendency to blow up because people weren't, you know, there were a lot of pressure from the steam. So the steam runs a pump, and the pump, uh, you know, runs the water. And those, they told me there that the old-fashioned pumpers give you about 500. You no, know, those, they didn't even, they didn't even rate them in gallons per minute because they just would stand them next to a church and see how high they could go relative to the steeple. But the steam engines were running about 700 gallons a minute, which was a huge improvement. And then uh, they went up, uh, the ones today that are run, you know, part of a fire truck run by diesel, those will give about 1,500 gallons a minute, which is, yeah, really big deal. So they'll take you through that, the history of those different ways of fighting fires right there. And the most interesting part to me was the horse stalls. 
Again, those are slip stalls, so the horses were standing there. They didn't have a lot of room to move, wooden floor, and they had doors like saloon doors that opened like that. And when the fire alarm went off, so when you're there, they, they go through this whole thing with you. They set off the fire alarm, <laughs> and th they said those horses knew when, they had, when a fire alarm was sounded anywhere in the city, it rang in that firehouse too. But for that firehouse, it was three long, it was clang, 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 and then it stops. And then clang, 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 stops. Clang, 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 and then a long pause, and then six. That's their fire company. And he said those horses, because his grandfather served with them, he says those horses knew when it was their alarm. Anyway, when, when that alarm went off, it also opened these doors, and the horses just ran, they didn't run out. They walked out to the, and stood by their equipment. They knew what, where they were supposed to stand. And, and the person who's tending the horses would let ropes go and drop the harnesses. The harnesses were overhead, <laughs> right on the horses. There was a, a quick hitch for the horse collar. It, just, it was just a snap hitch. And I'm just going to go on a little rabbit trail here. Uh, there, got, there was a fireman who invented that snap hitch, and it got so popular in the United States, he quit being a fireman, and that's all he did was make those little <laughs> collar snaps. Oh, okay. So the the um, okay. So then they hook the horse up. All you have to do is the the tugs from the harness attached to a chain. The chain snapped into the fire, into the steamer. So somebody was responsible for that. And then there was the engineer. And he was in the back, and he already had, there was a, uh, the heat source was coal. And so he would have a wood fire all set, ready to go. So as soon as the alarm went off, he would light the match, and that would start the wood, and the wood catch onto the coal, and there was two big coal bins, and out they would go. Oh, then, no, not yet, because I haven't got the firemen down here yet. So the firemen were upstairs, you know, if they were asleep, they would jump into their clothes, down the pole, and jump on the truck. Now, those two guys told me that the time was between one and two minutes from the time the alarm went to the horses out. And I think that's slow. Because in New York and Boston, they expected 30 seconds for all those things to happen in 30 seconds. Everybody had a job, and those horses did not walk out. They galloped out. <clears throat> This is a great picture I picked up in Boston of, of horses coming out. The year was 1900. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and then there's another picture. I hope you come take a look at these um, with the equipment. And there's the big the steamers there in the middle. And that's a posed picture, that one. This one was, they caught them right in action. So those are fun. <clears throat> So I, I, you know, horses were like, um, and fire horses were like the important horses of the city. They were very well trained. They, uh, they would get them to the fire. Um, and they would unhook the, the steam engine and get the horses away. When the steam engine had to be pretty close to the fire, and they would get the horses away. In the meantime, someone else was bringing a load of coal, <laughs> and they would dump it right by the steam engine. And uh, so they would shovel the coal in, and it would burn really hot and produce the steam, which would. And you know, uh, so steam is great, uh, but it needs a very large container. And so it worked really well for steam locomotives, because that big, long barrel was water that was being heated in a, on, a, uh, on a train, on a steam engine. You know where else steam engines are used? You need something big. Did you know that today's aircraft carriers are run on steam? Yeah, yeah that's steam power. And the, steam, and the power comes from, from uh, nuclear. It's nuclear power. So if you have a chunk of uranium here and a chunk of uranium here, they're both pretty stable. I'll bring them together and they start to, they produ that produces a lot of heat. That heats the water and that drives the uh, aircraft carrier. And it's also nuclear subs, same deal. That steam is run some. Same thing on all the oil tankers. I, I didn't know that. All, most of the oil tankers, they burn the bunker oil that they're carrying in steam-powered steam turbines. Okay, I, know, I didn't know that. That's good. 
So it takes something big. And like I say, those steam engines for fighting fire, uh, that one they have there is really great. It's immaculate. And it was not the one that was used there. The one that was used there, um, uh, that they have there is, was from Skowhegan. They used it in Skowhegan. Did they show you the uh, video in the, in the auditorium up there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they do. Thank you. When you go to the firehouse, they show you around as much as you want to be shown. And they have a thing that says, more upstairs. So you can go upstairs and see. They don't go with you, but you can go up and see the dorm uh, where the firemen slept and, and all that stuff. And then, um, let's see. They have a sort of little auditorium in there with a screen and they have a video. Yeah, they, had, they found a video, um, a, a, an old, I don't know what film it was, but they converted it to video. And he shows you a picture of them getting ready to go out in the fire and all the, the guy, the guys upstairs going down the pole, getting the thing ready and out the door. It's, it's a phenomenal video. So that's always the high point of the tour. I'm glad you remembered that. Yeah. Let me just say, from the horse's point of view, on Spring Street, where the fire museum is, it's right on the street. Yep. And they had to go out of that building and turn immediately left or immediately right. That's there right. was no going around the town square That's or right. going That's towards some other street. They had to turn. And it's amazing. I don't yeah. know how they got around yeah. the, out of the building safety. And there was a lot of, there was no sirens at the time, but they were ringing their bells. And the, Dal, you know, um, first of all, I should ask you, are there any Dalmatian breeders in the audience? Okay, good. Dalmatians were a perfect fire horse, uh, fire dog. Um, the reason I asked if there are any breeders is they, they can be a little snappy. And that's the way they're bred. That's the way they're bred. They were there to protect the horses. So they would run alongside the horses. And then any stray dogs that come in and try to bite a horse's legs, they'd attack them. And then they'd go right back to the... And they, they would use them for uh, crowd control at the fires, too. So, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is my personal experience. I would never, uh, there are some dogs I'd never been down to pat. And one, <laughs> I'll always pat a golden retriever. I would never bend down and pat a chow, a Dalmatian, or a cattle dog. So there you go. That's just personal experience. I've been nipped a lot. <laughs> um, okay. Well, another thing about I'm, I'm going to jump back to uh, um, New York for a minute. Macy's department store had its own stable, and if you bought anything over five dollars, free delivery. So they beat Amazon by 150 years. Uh, okay. Horse life in the city, I think, was not easy. The horses were bred on, uh, after, after the Civil War, there was a real, there weren't very many horses around. <clears throat> and so they shipped in thousands of horses from Europe and England. Now, if you were a funeral director in New York City, what kind of a horse would you be looking for from England? What, what order would you place? Black. Good, that's the answer. <laughs> they would only take black horses. Yes. Now, what if, you were, what if you were high society in New York City and you lived on Park Avenue and you could take drives? By the way, in, in New York, in, in Brooklyn, there was a road that started that went out to Coney Island. Mm -hmm. And it was, this is just for people to take their horses on drives and come back. And it was 200 feet wide, nine miles long. Yeah, and people used to go out on Sunday and show off their horses, show off their finery, <laughs> and show off their carriages. Yeah. Yes, Nick. Um, a lot of the cobblestones for New York City were made up on Clark Island, up off the Bruce End, and they had a very, they had a, you know, like a go-no -go gauge, a, a piece of wood that they slip the cobblestone through. And if the cobblestones didn't meet the specification for Manhattan, they'd get shipped to the Bronx. 
<laughs> and when they started making the Holland Tunnel, the specifications were so tight that the cobblestone makers had to go on day labor because they couldn't make enough stones to feed their family. And this is and that that's Clark Island, Maine. Huh. So that's that's a lot of the cobblestones for New York City came right here from Maine. So mostly granite? Is that what they were? Mostly granite. Yep. Granite, yeah. Did that wide thoroughfare become Broadway? I think so. I think so. I'm not sure about that, but I think so. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, uh, so life for these horses was not easy in the city. They would be bred on the farms after, uh, you know, after the Civil War, and then things got going, and people were breeding horses in the United States to the point where they started asking for them from Europe because they realized they were breeding some nice horses here. Uh, but a horse was bred and would be sold to someone in the city, a dealer in the city, as a five-year-old. They'd immediately put them on the rail cars, those are the ones that uh, would hold uh, 40, 50 people, and they were like trolleys, but pulled by two horses. And they would uh, put up, that would go for five years. They would, and then if they retire them at 10, and then they would go to someone who had, uh, you know, um, they were kind of done by that time, but somebody could use them for peddling and, uh, you know, uh, street vendors. And even after they were gone, uh, they had a use. Uh, the dead horses were picked up the street, the feet were used for gelatin, the um, horse hair was used for plaster binder and horse blankets. The meat went to dogs. Let's see, any other parts? Yeah, the, the ribs and the long bones were used for combs and other, uh, you know, knife handles. So, I think not an easy life. Not an easy, what's that? I still sleep on a horse hair mattress. You don't. I do. <laughs> there, there's a magic year where a lot of interesting things happened around here, and that was the year of 1872. One thing that happened was Julia Clapp Carroll, who was from, I think, the east end of Portland, but she was very well-to-do. She got tired of watching the horses getting beat on the streets and you know being mistreated. And she raised a fuss and she got some people behind her and they started the Maine State Society for the Protection of Animals. That was started to protect the, the city's fire horses and the, and, the horse, and the city's street horses. And um, I'm a member of their board and I, I can tell you it's wonderful what happens there. Horses are seized by the state of Maine. People get uh, uh, a um, agent, uh, ACO, what do you call it? Animal control officer from the towns will come out and if you're, they get a complaint, they'll come out and look at your horse and make suggestions. And if you don't, and then they come back. And if you haven't straightened out, um, they'll tell the state. The state will, can, has the authority to seize the horses, which they've done. And some of these horses you saw here this afternoon, if you guys were here, they were, all, were seized by the state. They go to the society, the society feeds them, gives them excellent veterinary care, um, trains them if they're kind of unruly, and then if they're adoptable, sends them out for adoption. So, 32 last year got adopted out. Am I right? Is somebody from the society here? 32. That's amazing, isn't it? Really wonderful. And the, the term is Maine State Society for the Protection of Animals. It's an old term. The, the state has nothing to do. Uh, we don't take, the, the society takes no money from the state. And it's all private donations. So if you're interested in uh, um, seeing what it's like, they're having an open house next Sunday from 11 to 3. I was supposed to tell you that. So I told you 1872, that's one thing that happened in 1872. Another thing that happened the year before was the Chicago fire. It was a very, very dry winter, not much snow, hadn't rained in several weeks, and Chicago caught fire. It did happen in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, but they're not sure whether she 
tipped over a lantern. That's the old, and now some people are saying, no, it was gamblers in her barn. But anyway, kerosene lantern lit the, the hay on fire, lit the straw on fire, and, and, and Chicago was devastated. It was a long fire. Yes, Nick? I, don't, I, I, I hate to keep interrupting, but these, these things just sort of dovetail. So one of the carpenters I learned from when I first started carpentering, he said when he was a young carpenter in the 1930s, one of the things that their biggest business in the springtime was, was mopping roofs. So they'd mop the roofs with linseed oil, pine tar, and turpentine, the wooden shingled roofs. And now that's illegal, you can't do it for fire reasons. So in the great Chicago fire, those roofs were just soaked with linseed oil, wow. pine tar, and turpentine. And they, this fella told me, he was from Vermont, and he told me that we were on a five-year schedule with most roofs. So he didn't do every roof every year, but every spring he was busy doing roofs. Mm -hmm. So if you just take that back, to, and when you look at old photographs of cities, or the roofs are black, and that's what happens with the linseed oil when you leave it out in the sun, it turns black on the wood. Yeah. So. Um, that was a, a huge contributor to the Great Chicago Fire. Okay, I did not know that. The yeah. embers would fall down on the roofs of the buildings next to them. It turns out that there was no really city planning at all, and the buildings were close together. Um, the, the Chicago, there's a river that runs down through Chicago, and it was so polluted that the river caught fire. <laughs> and it jumped over and went to the other half of the city, and the city was just wiped out. I'm telling you all this because there's a local uh, thing about this, and the, uh, there's a guy by the name of John Damrell, who was the chief engineer of the Boston Fire Department, and he heard about the Chicago fire, and he'd been fighting the city in Boston for a long time. He kept, kept saying, this is a dangerous city, it's ready to go. As soon as Chicago happened, he took the train out to Chicago, and he uh, uh, looked at the damage and what happened and came back and was ready to fight. He, he said, we are a tinderbox. And one year later, sure enough, Boston caught fire. <clears throat> one of the things in your work, Jim, that I did in the book was that the carriages and all the, the vehicles were on the first floor. The horses would be on horses the second on the floor, second floor. in the second floor. Right. And the hay was on the third floor. Right. And if the hay caught fire, you're done. All the, all right. the horses. And there, would, there could be thousands of horses in one, one story of a barn in New York City. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that happened after the Portland fire in 1866 was Portland was rebuilt with brick. Yes. Yes. And if you go through Portland, yeah. most of Portland is brick. So, um, Damrell came back and said to the city, Listen, we are a tinderbox. I just saw the, what happened in Chicago, and uh, they said, ah, we think you're exaggerating. Mm -hmm. So a building caught fire in, on Summer Street in Boston, and uh, this, this fire became the most expensive fire in United States history, then and since. Uh, something like a billion dollars worth of damage. Um, 30 lives are lost, half of those were firemen. And uh, it, was, it was devastating. Uh, the fire went down towards the docks, and it actually, some of the cinders blew over and hit on a, a sailing ship, and that burned to the water line. In Portland, sailors out that were out in Portland Harbor could see the glow from the Boston Fire, which is 100 miles as the crow flies. So it was quite a blaze. And one of the things that made Boston burn so bad was all of the fire engines were broken. The motors were broken. So what happened was in the fall of that year, fall of 1872, there was an epidemic of influenza in horses, equine influenza. And it started in a farm outside of Toronto. A couple of horses got sick and it swept through Canada, came down ripping through Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and within three months had reached the west coast, went down as far as Cuba, 
and there were no more horses to work. For several weeks, horses couldn't work. Have any of you here, I had bronchitis once, and I couldn't, I look at a set of stairs and think, oh, I don't know if I can make it to the top. So was it because all the horses were sick? Yeah, were they they're all sick. They didn't pass because of that, though? No, okay. no, they didn't. Uh, about the morbidity rate, which means how many would get it, about 99%. Because nobody had ever been exposed to it, they think it was a variant of an avian uh, flu. And uh, um, yeah, so it swept through the United States, and the horses, like in New York, for instance, there was nobody could get around, and and goods started piling up. The railroads were still working, but anything that was brought to a railroad to be shipped out was there, you know, was on the they couldn't get it to the platform. And anything that had been delivered just sat there and rotted. There was no coal delivery because coal, horses were important in the coal business. So it was called, they called it the, the Canadian disease, but it was equine influenza. I, you know, I, I went to a pretty good vet school at Cornell, and I had never heard of this. I'd never heard of this. I mean, I think that was something they should have told us about. How, <laughs> how bad a disease can be, you know? That's like, it was, it swept through like COVID. And the horses didn't die, but they wanted to. And they, it was several weeks before they could work again. So everything got piled. It caused a major recession in the United States. So they would be sick for weeks? They, was, they were, they, it took them weeks to recover. Yeah, it was just, you know, snotty noses, coughing, hacking. Yeah. They didn't have any of the drugs then? They had no drugs. They had no vaccine. Nothing. No. No, yeah, exactly. So it really did. And a lot of, a lot of horses were being trucked back and forth the country on railroad cars. And that, they think that's why it spread so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What year was this? 1872. 1872. Yep. Maybe there was a little shipping fever in there too, right? You know, that's, well, that's what some people call shipping fever. Influenza, yeah. And, you know, it's not that common now because working horses are all vaccinated, you know, pretty much. All vaccinated, yeah. And the vaccine is pretty effective. You know, it's, it's like the flu with people. You get some variants, so, you, you know, you don't always hit it just right on the vaccine. But the, the flu vaccine for horses is really quite, quite, uh, quite effective. All right. I've already gone over my hour. Have, have, have we got any questions? Can I? How much more do you have, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Let me think. <laughs> covered that Boston fire so uh, you know it, it, the, it's like this fire in Boston in, in 1872 it wasn't um, it wasn't just that the horses were sick and couldn't pull the fire engines because they got the fire engines out they were pulled by firemen and it took a lot of firemen but it did <laughs> it did slow it down you know it's it slowed down the response yeah so it wasn't the only thing because the building codes were terrible. A lot of the buildings were mansard roofs, you know, and they were flat and, you know, sparks that just jumped from roof to roof. Yeah. OK, I, I will quit. Um, I do want to um, read a, a poem that I, I've been talking about horses as living machines, which um, that came from this book, which was my source for a lot of this. Was called The Horse in the City. Fascinating book. Priscilla Wheatley, where are you? So Priscilla, Priscilla had a copy of it. She read it. She didn't want it anymore. If anybody would like a copy of that book, come see me. And if there's two or three people that want it, it's a wonderful book about horses in cities. Um, we can have a little mini raffle or something. And and. Uh, by the way, the money for the books, for my books, and that book was all going back, you know, the profits are going back to Skyline Farm. So I, I did want to say, because, you know, I talk about horses as machines, and um, I just like to read this poem about the connection. You know, there's a, a wonderful connection, and I used to see it every day when I worked with people and their animals, and people and their horses, and I don't want to gloss over that, because, like, it's huge. The name of this poem is One Beast. I thought that was a kind of goofy name, so 
I, I would have renamed it just A Visit to the Barn. <clears throat> Laying naked cheek against the smooth pelt of yours, I run my hand down hard, slant of bony head to supple silk of flared nostrils, steam my open palm, snuffing at pockets for apples. You lean the tonnage of your body against mine in camaraderie. You knock me off balance into the stable wall. You find this humorous. Lift and shake your head up and down in what can only be called a silent guffaw. I bury my head in peppery musk of your neck and shoulder, and I whisper, you did that on purpose, didn't you? These goodbyes are tender. All day we've romped as one beast, exploring the back fields, bravely snorting across the cold, rolling pebbles of shiny brook. And now that I've fed you whole oats that look as if we've knocked them ourselves off the heads of grasses and brought them in in our clothes, you chomp with true enjoyment, jaws working up a brown lather on freckled lips. It's time to meet, for me to go home and have my dinner, to sit erect with good manners, elbows off the table, chew with your mouth closed, with your mouth closed, and feel the coolness between human bodies. Ooh. Isn't that great? <laughs> uh, I met this lady who compiled these, and she was down to society. And if you want a good book of contemporary animal poetry by Alice Persons, incredible poems. Well, that's just one of the many. Hey, thank you for your kind attention. It was fun. Hmm? Oh, thank you. His ending remark. Yes. This is, this is my ending remark from King Edward VII, who was monarch of Great Britain from 1901 to 1910. Oh, that's one thing I didn't, at one point I didn't, uh, one point I want to make, ADD here. You know, we talk about, okay, this is, um, you know, this is the 1800 and the Civil War. Listen, the Civil War was sort of being fought before it was being fought. And it's still being fought in some places, you know. So dates only mean so much. Um, and, you know, my story about my friend in New Gloucester, he's, he's, he goes to the, the, the grocery store in a cart, and it's 1940, you know, by that time you would think, you know, and you, you wonder about today, whether they'll look back and say, oh, okay, this, here's when electric cars started. Well, you know, how many electric car owners here and has just... All electric? All electric. One. Okay? But in history, they're going to say they started in the year 2020. And everybody had electric cars. Well, they don't. You know? What's my point? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Back to King Edward VII, monarch of Great Britain, 1901 to 1910. Now, let you take this home. This is so cool. It doesn't matter what you do so long as you don't frighten the horses. <laughs> <laughs>